Welcome to Reaction 9, Week 9. Here we will continue from Week 7. Uh, week 8, we had a public holiday. So we go from the last segment of Lecture 7 to the first segment of Lecture 9. But we'll continue with the experiential clause grammar. So the general resource, the system of transitivity, is a resource for construing our experience of the flow of events. We still locate it then within the experiential metafunction at clause rank. And this is a system of transitivity. Just to recap very briefly from lecture seven. Interpreting the clause experientially means we look at it as a figure, a configuration of a process, participants directly involved in it and indirectly involved circumstances or attendant circumstances. And it is as a figure that the clause construes a quantum of change in our experience of the flow events. And this change then is modeled as the configuration of process plus participants plus circumstances. The process represents change through time. So in the quantum of change, the change itself is represented by the process. It's realized by a verbal group and in English, a core system of the verbal group is tense that allows speakers to locate the unfolding of the process through time relative to the now speaking past, present, future. Complementing the process, we have the participants involved in the process, bringing it about or being affected by it in some way, impacted by it or benefiting it from it. Participants are realized by nominal groups. And one of the key or core systems of the nominal group is the system of diaxis. That allows us to locate the referent of the nominal group as non-identifiable, meaning in your space of reference, I'm introducing this for the first time, a young grammarian, or as identifiable, specific, this young grammarian, the young grammarian, your young grammarian, locating it within the space of reference already identifiable to you. This is a system of diaxis. And you could say that this is a nominal analog of the verbal system of tense. Both are systems for locating the phenomenon that the group is concerned with relative to the now of speaking. In addition, addition to participants directly involved in the change, you find attendant circumstances or indirectly involved. And they're realized by either adverbial groups or by prepositional phrases. And prepositional phrases consist of a preposition, a kind of minor process, as we'll see, plus a nominal group. And it's a preposition in a way that reflects the indirect involvement of circumstances. Well, the process plus the participants, they represent, they represent a complementarity of change through time and persistence through time, the participants. And since the participants typically persist through time, they're involved in bringing about the change through time or being affected by it in some way. In a way, the limiting case is a change through time that brings into existence a participant. like Sir Christopher Wren built a gazebo, where the, this is being represented, the gazebo has been brought into existence by the process of creation. Last time I represented this, giving you a sense of it, saying it's analogous to our solar system. Or we could use a traditional Rutherfordian kind of model of the atom as an alternative. The sun, that's a process, and the planets most directly related to the sun, most directly involved in it, as it were, uh, are participants. 
and Pluto, <laughs> the ex-planet, uh, less directly involved in the process. These are circumstances. So we can talk about the nucleus of the clauses of figure, the configuration. Process plus one participant plus another plus possibly another and then more peripherally the circumstances. A combination of process plus participants, that's the domain of the system of process type. And we're talking about process type, the system, uh, this in this lecture, in lecture nine. So for example, the process might be shoot, shot, say in the past, two participants, Cheney plus him, and then one attendant circumstance specifying augmenting the shooting by Shaney of him in the face. And notice in the preposition here as were reflected the indirect involvement of circumstances. Now participants are typically inherent. So if I say shoot or shot, then you know there are two inherent participants, the shooter and the shooty, the actor and the goal as we uh, generalize their roles. Whereas the circumstance is typically not inherent. So you can perfectly well say uh, Cheney shot him without specifying the location. And so this would be clausalized as uh, Cheney shot him in the face. That would be one version. There are, of course, other versions. Interpersonally, then, this is a proposition, a statement. Cheney shot him in the face, didn't he? A declarative clause, so it's possible to tag it with a mood tag. Now let me stay on this theme of a motif of construing our experience of the flow of events. And I'll draw on an example uh, by a cognitive scientist, Lera Borotsky, talking about alternative ways of construing our experience of the flow of events. Well, that's how I'm glossing what she's uh, she's done. I've given you uh, a gloss here. Uh, she will give an example with bag and the relevant sense of bag is succeed in killing or catching an animal like my bag 19 cod. She will be talking about a particular event that occurred in 2006 and if you want to follow up on that you, you can find that it has a Wikipedia entry. This is Vice President Cheney. Well, the question is, how would this event be construed? But uh, let me give the floor to Lera. Um, now, the other thing that language does for us <laughs> is it helps us construe and construct events. So uh, events in the world are very complicated, and even simple events are complicated. And I know that sounds nonsensical, but here's what I mean. Take this example. Um, Dick Cheney, a few years ago, goes out hunting with his uh, buddy, uh, Harry Whittington, who happens to be a lawyer. And uh, Cheney shoots Whittington accidentally in the face. Right? So uh, there are many different ways that we could describe this event. But it's a very simple event. It doesn't take a long time to shoot someone in the face. It's a split-second event. And also, it's a simple physical event. It's not like, oh, the collapse of the global economy or global warming or any one of these more complex <laughs> events where there are many agents acting over time and many causal loops. It's not like that. Right? It's, it's really simple. And yet, we have many, many different ways we could think about it and describe it. So this is the way the European Herald described the event. They said, Cheney Bag's lawyer um, suggests he went out hunting for lawyers and he got one. Um, <laughs> Now, more canonically in English, you could say Cheney shot Whittington, or you could say Whittington got shot by Cheney. Uh, that removes Cheney a little bit out of it. You could just say Whittington got shot, um, leaving Cheney out of it altogether. Um, you can use uh, more vivid verbs. So in Texas, the newspaper said things like, Whittington got peppered pretty good. Uh, so you can bring a little flavor to your description. Um, this is what Cheney interview where he was get, uh, taking full responsibility for the event. Uh, he said, ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. 
And you can talk about all the other uh, conditions that existed at the time, but that's the bottom line. And no, uh, it was not Harry's fault. So that's very nice of him. Um, but look at that first sentence. He says, ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. So this is a split-second event, but he makes it into a chain of four events. right? And he just happens to be on one end of that long chain. Now, this is something language allows us to do. I can say, we built Rome, or we cured polio. And that's one verb for those very complicated, protracted events. Or I can use four verbs to say, I shot my friend in the face. Um, in fact, whenever you're choosing a verb, you're taking a perspective on how much time you're going to compact into an event, what makes an event. Bush did one better. He said, he heard a bird flush, and he turned and pulled the trigger and saw his friend get wounded. <laughs> that is a masterful exculpation. Right? Uh, here, Cheney transforms from agent to mere witness by the end of a single sentence. Um, of course, The Onion always has the best headlines. They said White House had prior knowledge of Cheney threat. Uh, August briefing warned Cheney determined to shoot old man in the face. Now, um, I'm giving you these examples. Obviously, some of them are jokes, but just to show how many options we have in how we construe even relatively simple events. And languages not only allow us a lot of these options, but they also differ from one another in what's canonical and how you normally would describe it. And it would be very interesting to pursue uh, variation across languages. Uh, we could look at the languages we share in our treasure trove, or we could wander further afield and look at languages that are markedly different from them. Uh, one celebrated example is Kalam, a uh, language of the highlands of Papua New Guinea, uh, where there is a tendency to construe events into a number of clauses that we construed in English, and also Chinese, probably as a single clause. English, Chinese, I think most of the languages we share in our treasure trove of languages have thousands of verbs. Kalam has about a hundred verbs. They're very general, but get serialized to represent more complex aspects of experience. Now you take this uh, Cheney Bags lawyer, right? You remember the gloss of bag. If we interpret this textually, interpersonally, and experientially, uh, textually the theme uh, Cheney is a theme. He's also held modal responsibly as, as responsible as the subject. So if you argued about it, he'd be the nub of the argument. Cheney Bags lawyer did he really? No, he couldn't have, etc. But in terms of construing experience, the process is bag, it's an action. We'll see that it's uh, part of a general category of process of material processes. And there are two participants, the bagger and the baggy. The one bringing it about, the doing the deed, we'll call this participant the actor, and the one impacted by it, the goal. It's characteristic of this type of process material processes. And you can in fact see, if you probe the clause, that the goal is impacted. So you can say what Cheney did to the lawyer was bag him. Or what Cheney did to the, with the lawyer was bag him. The process is realized by verbal group and the two participants, the actor and the goal, by nominal groups. Now let's consider briefly Cheney's version. And the point of this illustration is to emphasize the fact that English, like other languages, provide, provides us with quite a range of resources for construing our experience. And using the experiential grammar, or more generally the ideation grammar, in fact, that's precisely what we do. We construe or we construct our experience for ourselves. We model it using the resources of the language. You remember Cheney's example? Well, ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. What kind of construal is this? Well, it's setting up an identity, I, equal, I'm identi identical with, the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. Let's look at this a bit more closely. 
That's the clause, will ultimately. Textually, the theme is will ultimately I. So he's still, he's, uh, Cheney is constructing himself a theme. And then within the ream, the identity, right? Uh, interpersonally, he's constructing himself as modal responsible. I am, are you? You can't have been, and so on. So the mood is I am. And then experientially, even though you could say shooting somebody in the face is an action, it's doing a deed, he's actually construing this as an identity, right? The one being identified is I, I, and then the relationship of identity, this simple verb be in English, I'm, okay, in fact reduced to m uh, in, in the spoken version, I'm the one, okay, and then the identifier, and here he packs a lot of experience, experiential content, the guy, the guy who pulled the trigger, the trigger that fired the round, the round that hit Harry. You know these angle brackets, they represent downrank clauses, clauses that are embedded, in this case, to qualify which guy, the guy who pulled the trigger, which trigger, the trigger that fired the round, which round, the round that hit Harry. So again, you have verbal group and nominal groups. Uh, verbal group realizing the process and nominal groups the participants but this is not an action clause it's a clause setting up an identity most more generally a relationship and we'll call this type of clause a relational clause in English the most common verbs are be and have or be plus preposition like be at be in be around in Chinese Mandarin Chinese uh, these correspond to shi, yo, zai. Let's spend a couple of minutes looking at the nominal group, the guy who pulled the trigger, etc. We just look at the nominal group that serves as a identifier, identifying Shaney as a speaker. I equal the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the run that hit Harry. You have the first nominal group, the nominal group that serves as the identifier. It consists of the thing, the phenomenon being represented, the entity guy, and then a deictic that says specific, identifiable. And you remember right at the beginning of the semester, we talked about the or the. So it says it's a pointer, as it were, but I say I'm not going to tell you more than the fact is identifiable. The. Which guy? Well, that's the qualifier who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. How are these realized? With the by determiner, the thing by noun, and as is typical by anything that comes out of the after the thing in a normal group, uh, by either a phrase, prepositional phrase, or a clause. In this case, a relative clause. So this is the guy. Which guy? Let's qualify the guy. Well, the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the run <laughs> that hit Harry, a relative clause, with a relative pronoun who. And as you remember from the first assignment and the lectures on theme selection, relative elements, like who in this case, or that in the next two clauses, they serve both as topical theme because they are either participants or circumstances and as structural textual themes because they indicate how the clause is bound uh, to its environment, as it were. That relative clause, it is again a material clause. The process is pulled, and the two participants are the doer of the deed, who, actor, the guy who, and then the goal, the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. The goal is realized by nominal group, the normal group is the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. This is structured in the same way as the first normal group. Deictic, the, and then thing, trigger, what kind of entity, thing, trigger. And that tells you, you can identify the trigger. How? Well, with the help of the qualifier. 
The trigger, which trigger? The trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. The qualifier then again is realized by a relative clause with the relative element that, thematically both topical theme, unmarked, and structural textual theme. It's again a material clause. Again, the process is one of action fired and a doer of the deed, the actor, and a done to one impacted the goal. So that fired the round. And the round that hit Harry is realized by nominal group. That nominal group is again organized as deictic plus thing plus qualifier. And the qualifier is again realized by relative clause. And the relative clause is again organized, uh, sorry, realized uh, as a material clause, actor plus process by goal. Actor, the one doing the deed, that hit the round, uh, and process hit, and the impacted Harry. So if you go all the way from the representation of Cheney, the guy who, <laughs> he said, I equal the guy who, you have an actor in that clause, and then the ultimate goal, goal, Harry, embedded way down. So that's what Lera Borotsky referred to, the indirectness uh, in the relationship. Okay, So while Cheney construes the identity, he has, as it were, extended the sense of him being the actor acting on Harry quite significantly. Let's have a listen to Bush's version. So what Bush, is, Bush said in her interview, this is in 2006, about his vice president, President Cheney, he said, uh, as part of the interview, he likes the outdoors, he likes to hunt, uh, and he heard a bird flush, and he turned, and he pulled the trigger, and saw his friend get wounded. And then he has a comment on this. It was a deeply traumatic event for him, a, a deeply traumatic moment for him, him meaning Cheney. And obviously, it was a tragic moment for Harry Whittington. You see, I've color coded these. Red means these are clauses that represent to process of consciousness, sensing. So Bush is, as it were, representing Cheney's consciousness in terms of emotions, like the outdoors, and perception. He heard, he saw. And then blue, these are clauses of actions, activities. A bird flush, he turned, pulled the trigger, his friend got wounded. And green, uh, these are relational clauses, characterization, characterizations, where the verb is be in this case. It was a deeply traumatic moment for him. It was a tragic moment for Harry Whittington. Obviously, here is, of course, an interpersonal comment, a comment adjunct. You can see that the mental ones with hear and so, say, they have participants that are, in fact, realized, there are, in fact, acts, and they're realized by clauses, clauses that are downranked, embedded. In this case, both clauses are material ones, a bird flush and his friend get wounded. He likes to hunt. Right? The clause in itself is an action material, but it includes an attitude towards hunting uh, using a mental verb. He likes to hunt. This is what Push said. Uh, uh, likes the likes outdoors, outdoors, he likes, he likes, likes to, hunt. to hunt. And, uh, and uh, he heard a bird, bird flush, flush, he turned, he turned and, and pulled the trigger, the trigger and saw, saw his friend, friend get wounded. If you want to watch the whole sequence of the interview uh, you have the url the youtube so we are representing here or bush is representing us to say the event using different process types and that's what we'll now focus focus on transitivity within the system of transitivity the system of process type and as i said before this involves the domain of the process plus the participants involved in the process
The system of transitivity, then, is the experiential system of the clause as a figure, a model of a quantum of change in our experience of law events, organized as a configuration of process plus participant or participants and optionally circumstances. And with Leah Borotsky's help, uh, we've seen that there are lots of options in how we construe our experience of the flow events. And what gets chunked into one quantum of change or more than one quantum of change. So in Cheney's version, uh, you have this complex construct with the identity being set up. In Bush's version, you have a sequence of quantum of change. involving Cheney's consciousness, but as it were, diffusing him as a trigger puller. So the component systems of the transitivity, the process system of process type, which we're looking at now, the system of process type, the sorting out of goings on uh, of quantum change into small number of different domains of experience, each with a model of the nature of the process, and the nature and number of participants. So I've already introduced you to a few of these using the terms uh, in the description of the grammar, material, mental, relational. And then also, which we'll come to later, the system of agency. The modeling of the initiation of the process as being initiated involved by one participant, we'll call these middle clauses, or being initiated by an external cause, we don't call these middle clauses, we call them effective clauses. Okay, I'm proofreading on the fly. So these affect the domain of process plus participants. We'll fit focus now on process type and come back to agency. We'll also come back to a system that is used to augment this combination of process plus participants, the system of circumstantiation. The augmentation of the configuration of process plus participant or participants involved in it by means of circumstances. Augmenting the configuration by elaborating it, circumstances of role, extending it, circumstances of accompaniment, or enhancing it, circumstances of time, place, different types of cause, different types of manner, and a few others. But as I said, I will now focus on the system of process type. Let me round off this segment by giving you one more example. And this is an example of the representation of somebody's consciousness, in this case the speaker or singer. I've loved you three summers now, honey. Textually then, I as theme and the ream have loved you three summers now, honey. Interpersonally, it's a proposition, it's a statement. The one being held modular, held modular responsible is I. So it would come up in the mood tag. I've loved you three summers now, haven't I? Or, I've loved you three summers now, honey, haven't I? Or I've loved you three summers now, haven't I, honey? In the mood element then is I have. That's what gets picked up in the mood tag and argued about. No, you haven't, have you? Well, you ought to have. In terms of experience then, this is a representation of consciousness, of an emotion, emotion of loving, two participants, a lover and a lovey, <laughs> right? More generally, we call them sensor plus the phenomenon being sensed. In this case, I, involved in the process of loving, and the phenomenon of uh, being loved is, is you. But then there are also two circumstances. Three summers, the duration of loving, and time, the time of loving, now. And they are realized the process by verbal group with this tense selections have loved, the participants by nominal groups, and the circumstance of duration, interestingly, by nominal groups. There are a few circumstances that are realized by nominal groups. Circumstances of extent in time, duration, or space, distance, are often just nominal groups, but with some kind of measure of time, like three summers. And the circumstance of location in time, time, by an adverbial group now, as opposed to then or yesterday, 
tomorrow. And this is from Taylor Swift's song Lover, which has come up before. So we have our combination of process plus inherently involved participants. Have loved, I, you. And the process type here is one of mental processes, more specifically motive, love, hate, adore, detest, and so on. And what's being sensed is phenomenal rather than macrophenomenal, metaphenomenal. We'll come back to that. And in terms of agency, which we'll also come back to, it's middle rather than effective and ranged. The system of process type and agency then together determines the nature of the process and the nature of the number and number of participants directly involved in the process. The domain is uh, determined by the system of process type. And then you have the augmentation of the uh, process plus participant combination. Circumstantiation, in this case two times, duration, extent in time, and time location in time the systems of circumstantiation the system of circumstantiation determines the augmentation of the combination of process plus participant to participants by one or more attendant circumstances in this case too and just to help you remember this have loved you three summers now honey There you go. That's it. That's how long it takes to sing, sing that clause, if you're Taylor Swift. So that's the end of this first segment. In segment 9-2, we'll continue with process type. Thank you.